to the Fully Charged Plus podcast. Now, it's not often that we have someone from the world of motor racing on the Fully Charged Plus podcast. In fact, I don't think we've ever had one. I've really racked my brains. I can't think of anyone. And what's going to be annoying is someone's going to tell me, well, well didn't you remember when you interviewed uh, Lewis Hamilton? And I'll go, did we? And no, we didn't. Uh, one day, maybe. Uh, anyway, uh, this week's guest, Mark Preston, worked for the Arrows Formula One team for six years. And he was then, he then went on to be the principal designer at a little known car company called McLaren. He was the principal designer at the McLaren Formula One team. And after that, Mark went on to create his own uh, Formula One team, Super Aguri, uh, in conjunction with many other companies, including Honda. But so then I'm guessing that he knows a thing or two about motorsport and cars with very loud engines that go very fast. But this is all proper high-end engineering and development at the very cutting edge of the technology available. Fair enough, but Mark isn't doing that now. He is now the team principal of the Tech Cheetah Formula E team, uh, which is from the, uh, which is backed by the DS, basically the, the Citroen, Peugeot, Vauxhall, all those people, that company, DS Automotive, a uh, big French company, and uh, he's also the CEO of a company called Street Drone, which is developing autonomous last mile delivery systems. Really interesting. He's basically a bit clever in the car department, so it was a great pleasure to record this episode with him. But just before we start, I just want to play you a message from our wonderful, gorgeous and altogether magnificent sponsors, without whom this podcast would simply not exist. My Energy is putting the eye back into British innovation. My Energy is putting the eye back into inventing the future. My Energy is putting the eye back into inspiring a nation. Recharging the world with green smart energy. Charge your EV with your PV and more. Visit myenergy.com and help to spark the green revolution. My Energy. Driving the charge to a greener future. Well, let's get on with the show. Please welcome to the Fully Charged Plus podcast, Mr. Mark Preston. So, Mark, uh, well, for a start, thanks for finding the time to talk to us, because I actually know, sometimes I say, taking the moment out of your busy schedule, but I know you've actually got quite a lot on, so I'm really impressed. So, I think, I mean, I think let's jump in, because I would love to talk about Formula E and what you've done prior to this, but because this is so current and exciting, so you're about to go to Saudi Arabia. Correct, yes. Which is in itself an amazing thing because it's quite hard to go to Saudi Arabia in any, at any time. It's not, a, it's not a place you – people don't go, oh, we're going to on holiday to Saudi this year. You, know, you just don't <laughs> hear that. <laughs> yeah, we've got, there's a lot of organisation going on behind the scenes. And, I bet. Um, yeah. I've actually got a big checklist. Actually, our team managers sent us a te- uh, checklist actually today because there's lots of things we have to do. We obviously have to get PCR tests before we fly 48 hours before – so that's all signed off. Um, we're going on a charter flight, so it's all special. Everybody's going together from London, Paris, and and Frankfurt, I think it is. Right. Into you know the whole the whole um, ecosystem, let's say. Um, when we arrive, we have to go into quarantine for a few days. Then we wow. have to have another test. Then we, if that's okay, then we go to the racetrack, and um, and we sort of do the same on the the return journey. Right. And um, yeah, everything's extremely well organised, and I must say. Because we did um, the race last year in Berlin, um, I think we proved to everybody, including governments like you know the Saudi government and, and the UK government, that we can be uh, seen as responsible to make sure everything's done properly. So right. yeah, just making sure I don't forget something on my yes. checklist list. <laughs> yeah, my goodness, I mean it's a huge logistical operation. Um, I mean because I don't actually, I mean I, we don't have to talk about it in any detail, but I don't actually know what the situation is, is regarding the, the pandemic in Saudi. Presumably, have they, I mean they must have it. I'm sure it's there. Yeah, I think they might be on one. I'm not exactly sure which list they're on in terms of the UK and both right. sides. Um, but uh, because both governments are working together with Formula E and with the FIA then um, they're making sure that, okay, you can come to Saudi and we can come back, okay. Right. Um, we just have to go through all of the procedures and processes that, that they're defining. So yeah. I think it's a special exemption, but, but because we're doing all of the things that they've asked to do a, a sporting event. 
Yeah, yeah. But because how many, I can't imagine how many people are involved. I mean, I've been to, I think, five or six Formula E events around the world. And there seems to be a lot of people, you know, when you like, if you walk along the pit lane, it's not quiet. There's quite a lot going on. So the, yeah. the, the biggish teams. Yeah, we're, so we're, we're, yeah, the difference between what we've got, let's say, in, in F1 is that um, we're actually going down on the number of passes allowed. So at the track, we're allowed to have 17 people who can touch the car as such. That's right. the mechanics and the engineers. They don't let me touch it, so that's right. okay. I'm not in the 17 because, you know, I'm irresponsible. No. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's a few of us that, that um, don't touch the car. So total, we probably have up to about 30 people that travel. Um, that right. includes all of the support staff for um, sponsors and guests and people like that. But the actual core people that are allowed to work and touch the car is only 17. It's, it's only 17, yeah. And presumably the driver, they're generally allowed to touch the car. <laughs> they're, they're, it's over and above. So the, the two drivers, and then we also have a reserve driver. So, right, uh, right. They're, they're allowed to touch the car as well, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, because the, the, it has been such an interesting... So I'm not a big sport fan i've discovered but i love i do I, I was so blown away with formula and i was quite involved with it televisually before it started i did a lot of stuff for itv about the batteries about the motors about the design of the cars and all that stuff and then i went to see some races i haven't really kept up with it you know it, it depends if someone you know i think the last time i went out it was i think it was jlr I took he said come with us and had a jolly with them in paris that was paris oh yeah but it is. I mean, I, it's it's so fascinating to see how rapidly the the, the tech has developed. Because when I when you look back now at the first generation Formula E cars, they didn't go they didn't go very far. <laughs> I yeah. think is the thing we can say. <laughs> they weren't slow, but they were they didn't go that far, did they? And that was. When did, when did you start getting involved in electric cars? You've been doing it for quite oh, a while, haven't you? Oh, a long time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes. I can't remember. Well, certainly. I mean, I've been doing fully charged for coming up to 11 years now so yes it's been a, a while so i first started looking at electric cars when i helped um oxford university looking at spinning out a company called oxford yasa motors oh god right? yes so, i know yasa yeah and then and back then i think that's when top gear did that crazy car that was driving around oxford what was that called the they, they built oh, the, one, the one that looks out of cardboard boxes it looked like yes yeah <laughs> So um, I, I use that now in my presentation to sort of say that's where it sort of yes, well, I started that's how it started. about that time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now when you come forward to what's possible yeah. now, it's, I mean, at the beginning of Formula E, and, and you know this because you, you were around at the, at the time, most people thought we were crazy. That's number yes. one. Yeah. And most people said, you're never going to get a race car to, to work, an electric race car. And right. so, yeah, all of our friends in F1, so I, I started in F1 before before. Right. Formula e. And um, most of them thought we were crazy, and and um, but now you know we've got a lot of people in in Formula E that have come across from from series like yeah, that, yeah. Like that, so. I mean, it did seem ugh, hugely unlikely. I mean, I remember look, I interviewed an amazing man. I think he was Turkish battery engineer at Williams. Yes. Uh, you, you, I'm sure you know him. I can't remember yes. his name now, but he was such an extraordinary man to interview. It was an absolute joy. And uh, when he showed me the kind of huge box that the battery, the, that original battery pack went in yeah. and the, the kind of engineering that went into protecting it for a high speed collision and keeping it cool and keeping it chat, all that stuff was amazing. But I mean, since then, I, I don't even know what, I can't remember what the capacity of that battery was, but it wasn't that big you know, no, by today's had, standards. We had 28 kilowatt hours. I think. 28 kilowatt, wow. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> so um, we're obviously double that now. I've actually been doing a little bit of um, research to make sure I know a little, a few more of the numbers right. compared yeah. <laughs> a road car because I've got a DS3 crossback, the, the E10 Swan. Right, one. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm learning a bit more about the, the things that are similar from the yes. road car to the road car. Um, and uh, actually been working with DS to understand some of the parameters on, on road and race. So right, right. The race and the road car have around 50 kilowatt hours battery now. Usable so, capacity, um, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so that's interesting. So you can carry out a full Formula E race with 50 kilowatt hours. Yes, correct. Right. That is, yeah. But, but some interesting statistics, because I've been looking at this, is that the driver has to save around 35% of energy to get to the end of the race. Right. So if they don't save 30% 30, 30 of energy, they won't make the, the end of the race, um, at least racing at speeds that, you know, could right. be competitive. Um, so that the FIA deliberately calculates the, the race, um, well, it's 45 minutes, but the yeah. track has worked out so that... Um, 
you basically use the entire battery's um, energy, but you right. have to save that much energy in order to finish. Right. So if, so if a numpty like me, I wouldn't drive very fast because I'd be too scared, but did the same distance around that circuit, like not in a race, yep. I would use up pretty, I mean, because I wouldn't be as good a driver, I would use up pretty much all that capacity covering Correct. that distance. Yes. So they've got to really be clever and work out how to, because that's some of the things I don't know now, because um, I remember, I do remember talking about it at the time. And this is so before any of the, there hadn't been a Formula E race when I was interviewing people like this. But uh, the, the does the driver have quite a lot of control over levels of regen? Yes. yes. So that because that's going to make the difference. I want to imagine if you're doing 120 miles an hour and you need to slow down a lot to go around a corner. So I've got a little number here. So you know, oh, in your DS3 um, crossback, when you lift off in what's called the B, the braking the braking mate, yeah, yeah, you get about 0.13 of a G. But right. in the race car, when you fully when you pull the paddle and you're getting the full 250 kilowatt regen, you can be up to about 0.7 of a G. So yes. it's quite a lot when you pull on the paddle. Yeah, it's like so a heavy they, braking. Yeah, yeah wow. Basically but wait a minute. Car. So that and you can generate. Gee, that is unimaginable because there are some cars that will give you a, a, a representation of what you're generating. So the, the the Hyundai Kona that my wife drives, if you that's got three levels of of regen okay. braking, and when you're going down a hill, yeah, at say 50. It's it's putting out like fifty five kilowatts, yep, you know. Which yep. you think that is a rapid charge? That's amazing. But when you but in the Formula E, is it two hundred and fifty kilowatts? Yes, regen mode. <laughs> it's so, insane, isn't it? I mean, it's only for a few seconds, but it's still yeah. a huge jolt of power, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, exactly. And and that's what. Um, so you know, we're gonna, we're playing around with you know when you're in your road car. I'm sort of driving along and trying to lift. And then also when you just touch the brakes, it yeah. gives you an extra. A little bit extra. So, yeah, I'm just sort of like, you know, trying to be like the driver when I'm coming down yeah. to, a, to a stop now and uh, see if I can learn. And then when I go to the racetrack, I'm like, so is it really that hard to do that bit of lifting and coasting and get yeah. like, the end of the, um, the end of the braking zone, et cetera. And yeah, yeah, there's a lot of work the drivers have to do in Formula E now. Yeah, I would imagine they're really busy and, and, and like maintaining your focus on that on that aspect of it. I mean, because I, you all know, well, okay, Formula One driver, because I, I, uh, my brother worked in that industry for a long time and I, so I've sort of grown up with it, but like the high level, sophisticated, more recent level, yeah. their fuel use is obviously monitored to the last atom. Yeah. But is the driver sort of as aware in a Formula One car of their, you know, when they might need to refuel as a, as a Formula E driver is? And are they, they're not like, because you can't reach in with petrol. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, to answer the question, in a, in a Formula One car, they'll be told the strategy level to be running. So it'll be pre-calculated that they, to get to the end of the race, running flat out, they need to be at this strategy level. But in right. Formula E, you've actually got to pull the regen paddle to put you know energy back into the battery. Where yeah. the F1 car's only got a certain amount of battery it can store per lap. Yes, so they do. I mean, there is regen on a Formula One, modern Formula One exactly. car, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, there's a lot more work for the driver to do in Formula E because not only when you when you do regen, you also lift at the end of the straight. You lift to save some energy. Right. Some racing you have to do that in Le Mans sometimes, but F1, I don't believe they have to do that in the race at the moment. But at that time, that's when someone can overtake you. Because yes. if you're lifting to save energy, they might say, I don't need to lift this lap, so I'm going right. to go straight past you. So they're concentrating on saving energy, um, racing, yeah. <laughs> thinking about the strategy. Yeah. And then the engineers will tell the engineers how much amount of battery is left. Right. Um, because we, that's a deliberate thing from the FIA to make it harder for everybody. So we have to tell, or the driver has to tell the engineers what uh, amount of energy they got left, and then the engineer. So, so the engineer, at the, at like in front of all the laptops, they can't see the battery level. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's that gets okay. Yeah. So yeah. the driver really does have to keep an eye on. That. Yeah. So he has to keep an eye on that, and then he also has to keep an eye on the temperature, basically, of the battery. Yeah. So we we basically predict so that. Just as we're crossing the line at the very end of the race, it goes to zero wow. percent. So, um, one of our engineers, um, Pascal, he's the head of strategy, and he's he's very happy when he crosses the line and it's exactly on zero right. in the battery. And it's funny because I've been driving my you know the road car again and thinking, can I drive and get home with exactly, exactly. zero as I cross? <laughs> 
but I haven't got enough tools. No. Like, <laughs> yeah, that is quite that is quite complicated. I mean, I yes, I think I've done. I mean, I've deliberately run out to see what happens. The car yeah. stops. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then, but then I got back here once, very late at night, in a Nissan Leaf, and it was at naught. So I didn't know, but I actually it was only at naught for maybe the last two miles, and most of that's downhill where I live. So that was so it wasn't. I thought I'll get home. Doesn't really matter, and it was fine. But that was the only time I've done that. So that's in ten years of driving electric or that particular car. But then the um, I had a really important question, and it will come back to me in a moment about that. Uh, damn, it's so annoying. Oh, ah, well, I suppose the big question is, which is which is certainly a. A, a, an important thing is that transition of the technology. I mean, Formula One's a good example. The, the, the stuff that was developed in Formula One cars that did eventually find its way into, so traction control and disc brake. I mean, if you go yeah. way back, it is literally yeah. disc brakes, <laughs> hydraulic disc brakes yeah. were, were certainly a racing car invention first. And is that, are you seeing that or are you aware of that happening with Formula E? I mean, I suppose it, the, the best example I can think of that like the, you know, comes to the front of our minds is that in the season one, we had five gears, if you remember. In, yes, in of course, I had gears. Yeah. And I think at the beginning, certainly before Formula E started, Myself, when I was discussing with a number of engineers, we weren't sure whether it would go the way of the quick shift gearboxes for F1, where they can shift simply um, with electric motor of a different size, or it would be one motor. And, and at the time, I don't believe anybody had enough technology to do that. Um, but over time, everybody's iterated down to a single direct drive ratio. So yeah. I think you can see that that has really been worked out. Um, yeah. In the beginning of Formula E, we couldn't do a full qualifying lap and come into the pits without potentially overheating the motor, but we don't have wow. any of those problems anymore. We don't wow. worry about the, you know, the um, overheating of the stator and, and other things. The battery, there was more people that would get to the end of the race and actually overheat the battery and it would switch off. Right. Um, I don't think that's happened for quite a while now in Formula E. Um, when I talked to the, the guys at DS, a lot of the initial work they did um, in the first um, seasons helped to guide the engineers in the in the road cars about regen, what right. was possible, what made sense. So, of course, when you go towards one um, one motor um, direct drive in, in racing, then, of course, that you can get confidence when you're developing a road car and say, well, yes. in racing it worked, it worked, and we were competing up against Nissan, Renault, Porsche, Audi. Yeah. So, um, we, we won against them, so it must be a good solution. So there's also a lot of processes, I understand. So some of the things that we use for designing the motors and those sort of things, the techniques and processes can also go over to the road cars as well. Right. So the other thing about racing I've always found is that you can take more risk because we're really only taking one year of risk. So yeah. with the powertrain gets homologated every year. Right. Whereas when you're developing a road car, of course, you've got to do it. And it might be on the road for 15, 20 yeah. years. So yeah. You've got to make decisions that we're going to stick for that that yes. time. So yeah. experimenting and racing and trying things and 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 checking if things work and then saying that's solid. It works in racing. That should be okay for the road. That's the kind of confidence levels that I believe you know come yeah. to everybody. I mean, I think it has. I think you can sort of sense that that the uh, that the technology would always have developed, but it, I always get the feeling that, 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 that it just pushes it faster, I think, and that understanding and the, probably the design, the design of electric motors will have been adapted because they'll have worked that out. I mean, I, I mean it's interesting you mentioned uh, Yasa Motors because that was one of the very first companies I went to visit when I was doing Fully Charged, when I first yeah. started it, because I was just fascinated by it. It, it, it was such an unusual story yes. for a manufacturing company in the UK to start and actually make stuff that then goes on to be used in, you know, the land speed records and all kinds of amazing applications those motors have been in. Yeah, they, they, I understand they're going quite strong. And um, I was talking to some investors recently, and I think uh, they're, yeah, they're going from strength to strength. Yeah, at the moment. yeah, so, so yeah. they're still out there making electric motors. Which is amazing. And they're so, uh, you know, refined and exquisite. I mean, they're just amazing pieces of machinery. They're like sculptures, aren't they? They're stunning. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they are indeed. But, they, they are but indeed. they're not used in Formula E, are they? Their motors are not, are not used. I don't know if they supply anybody, anybody in racing. I do believe they did at one point. Um, right. But I'm not sure if they do at the moment. Right. Uh, there may but be some of their technology somewhere in there. Yes, I bet. But then that's one thing. So the ver that's the thing I remember very clearly. The very first season, the cars were effectively identical. 
uh, other than the suspension and steering. I think the teams could adjust that. But so now that's not that's no longer the case with Formula E. You can actually build your own car within the so, specified. Thing. Yeah. So in season one, everybody had the same cars and the yeah. same gearbox and the same powertrain. And then season two, they opened up to allow the manufacturers. So where were DS automobiles? And so right. they do the powertrain. Um, right. That includes the rear suspension. So they do the powertrain, not the battery. Um, no. But the the main powertrain and then we work together with them on software um so the software is quite open so a lot of the work we do is basically on software so yeah optimization techniques for saving energy so that's why a lot of this you know learnings can go back to the to the roadcast because it was a lot of software um yeah. and development at the moment that is that is really interesting isn't it that that, that has happened because i don't know i i think it is one of those sports that people who are interested in electric cars and that area of the world so the energy transition in the broadest possible sense are very aware of it but i don't know how far it's gone and what the impact has because if you you know like saudi arabia is a good example they kind of got an economy that is built on fossil fuels i think that's that's not an exaggeration yeah. Yeah. so for them to then witness you know, really impressive machinery flying around at an incredible speed with an enormous sort of, you know, team structure around it. It isn't like it's one mad professor with an electric car that goes quite fast. It's clearly a big organisation, which is what has always blown me away about it is the scale of it is impressive. But I, I'm fascinated to know how the general public in Saudi Arabia will respond to that and how they, I mean, does it... I can't bloody judge at the moment, but in the past, the crowds have always been, I've always been in, really intrigued by the crowds at Formula E races because it's a different experience. I grew up near Silverstone. I went to yeah. Silverstone, saw Formula One races, and your ears were bleeding when they started. I mean, the noise was unimaginable, you know. Well, I grew you... up in Australia, so with V8 supercars yes. and those kind of things. And, and until I finished in F1 in about 2008, when I used to run Super Aguri at Formula One with, with Honda, Right. And at that point, I knew nothing about electric cars. I'd never even considered that, you know, yeah. you would ever drive one or think about one. And I think it's probably the same as for everybody. You know, we were probably a little bit ahead of the, the curve um, looking at all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, anybody else saying, but aren't they still just milk floats? Now, maybe yeah, that's yeah. gone away. <laughs> yeah, something that has gone away finally. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think a few years ago, there was only G Wizards and, and things yes. like that on the yes. road. But now there's a, I think you've probably watched it. There's, there's, big um, increase in the amount of cars now. Oh, I presume unbelievable. It's fully yeah. charged live events. I'm sure you've got more yeah. more possible solutions. Oh, now. it's more terrifying. Yeah. Well we've just done a we've just done a, an episode where I think we did we listed seventy four well, cars okay. that are available in North America and Europe. See. So that so nowhere yeah, but I mean it is extra seventy four different cars. So some from the same manufacturers, but a huge range and that is now, and all we know is this massive list of cars that are being launched in the next 12 months. I mean, it is very, and it's then, exhausting, you, actually. <laughs> do you find that, that, that things are changing on the cars as well, in the road cars? Like you're noticing new specifications and things that they're bringing out? I yes. So that is, and it it's very dependent on the manufacturer, but there are, so there is a huge debate, uh, which yeah. we don't need to go into now, about, you know, built ground up cars. So you're, mm -hmm. I, you're, i3s you have nissan leafs your zoe's yeah. and then things like well in fact a car that we, is uh, we, we've got going out today the the uh, uh, the ec4 citroen ec4 sorry just had to remember what it was yeah. which is which you can get a petrol one a hybrid one or pure electric yeah. and that and i think this is my opinion there are they're forced to make compromises mm. in that because you're making that on the same production line and when you see that happening yeah. it makes sense to build a motor, the control system, the battery management system, all in a block that is essentially the same size as an internal combustion engine, because yes. you've got somewhere to put that. And when you don't have that, yes, I can't help thinking that's a better idea. But I totally understand the economics of it because you've got this massive production line. Are you going to scrap that, throw yeah. that away? You know, and I mean that is now happening. Volkswagen, for example, for example, have changed their production line, which is where they make the ID three. Yeah. And they are making it cheaper. I mean, that is the thing. It is a, a cheap, that, that sort of news is just coming out. But certainly we're seeing, you know, if you, uh, when I drove a G Wiz, <laughs> my, two, my two emotions were sheer terror because I was on the streets in London and then hysterical laughter. 
<laughs> trying to drive it off over some very mildly roughish ground car park in East London and it just couldn't cope. You know, seen so now in Formula E also we've got some new you know, some new features if you haven't been watching Formula E in the recent past. All right. We also have something called attack mode where the drivers have to go offline and go through two areas and uh, it- Yes, no, I sorry, I have seen that. Yes, there's a slightly <laughs> different route they can go on. I'm not sure when we're going to get that on the road, though. I'm not sure if you have to kind of go off the the left into a lay-by and get some extra energy and go off into the future. But But it would would be great. Certainly, I know our listeners would love it because if you, when you see it, I mean, when when you stand by the track and you see one go past, they're going fast. Yes, Yes. that's fine. And the noise, I I find the noise fascinating. So the last time I remember being really close trackside was in Paris. And the... And there was a, I think that was the first time they had the eye pace race yes. beforehand. Yeah. And there were a couple of quite bad shunts yeah. <laughs> on that race. But what was fascinating was, you know, if that had been a, a saloon car race with V8s, like you would have in Australia, you wouldn't have heard any of this. But what you heard was that what it reminded me of was when my children had a plastic box, which they have toys in, and they've got a string on it and they're dragging it across the, the the patio is a really weird sort of hollow plastic grating noise. And that was the sound of bits of eye pace racing bodywork that were hanging off because they rammed into someone else. And it was, and then the guys would come out and sweep the track of lumps of plastic, basically that had come off the cars. It's but that, uh, isn't it? You get to hear a lot more like um, totally different you know, sounds don't you. Yeah. yeah. When you're the bouncing over the curbs and things like that, yeah. as you say, an accident sounds a lot more, sort of dramatic when someone hits the wall and, and you can yeah. hear it. Um, it's funny, cause sometimes we're in the in the garage and it's quite quiet and we can tell something's happened because you hear the war, roar of the crowd. Right. So like, you'll hear this big <laughs> they love a crash. noise and you're like looking on the TV going, what's right. happened? What's, what's happened? happened? <laughs> <laughs> so when there's, a, when there's a race going on, are you in one of those with all the screens with the headphones on? Yes. Very yes. cool. That's the cool. That's where the cool people are. I can tell that. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's a bit like, um, you know, I watch the numbers and it's a bit like, I don't know, in the Matrix. I got so used to watching just timing screens. I think right. sometimes when my wife watches me, she said, what are you actually watching? And it's like, yeah. well, I'm watching all the numbers. I know what all the numbers mean and how it all works together. Um, but yeah, when there's a when there's a big ooh ah from the crowd, then you know that something else has gone on somewhere around the track. So you're yeah. looking, looking to see what's happened in the in the in the race. Yeah, because I mean, what are the sort of basic stats? The kind of I mean, do you know that the kind of not to 100 kph or all those ones? I, I have yeah. no idea what those are now. So um, let's see what's the, what have we got here? So XL it's about 2.8 not to 100 kilometers an hour, whereas the, right. the normal DS3 is about 8.7. So yeah, pretty fast. Um, that's yeah, that's we, painfully fast. I mean, I've experienced it. It's not relaxing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're about um, 230 kilometers an hour top speed, but that's right. that's optimized for the racetracks. So we yeah. race in city centers, and so that's the optimization. I think the car could do about. 270 280 if right. we um if we just weren't worrying about optimization so yeah f1 is in the re- realms of 320 normally so yeah. not that far away but we race obviously in completely different you know tracks. yes yeah yeah um, no it's much tighter track isn't it always yeah yeah so we've got about 100 kilometers range in the right. uh, in the car so that's approximately how it turns out because the race is over 45 minutes plus one lap so right. one of the difficulties compared to say f1 or something else is you know how many laps you've got to do but with us if the race happened to be a bit slower or a bit faster it changes the amount of energy you're going to use because it's 45 minutes but you right. might do a longer distance so that makes it a bit difficult wow so people can make a mistake you know in in that um we run sort of like 900 to a thousand volts whereas you know most road cars are well, anything from 48 up to sort of a few hundred, although the, yeah. the Taycan is now quite quite high, isn't it? Yes, That's yeah. Um, single gears. Um, we don't actually charge that fast at the track. so Well, because now you don't, it's no real need to, is there, in that sense? No. You don't need to be able to do it in a few minutes. I mean, you know. So we, we, we've got about an 80 kilowatt charger at the track, but we're also right. sharing the power amongst all the cars. All the cars, so all right. the cars are charging at the same time, so all 24 cars. Will be charging around about the same, yeah, around about the same time. So it sort of it has to fit within a, sort of an hour of charging. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of some of the numbers that you know that we're working on. 
Um, I'm trying to get some more interesting numbers, you know, about yeah. how energy we, we save and things that are, that are easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, those ones, I mean, I think that's the critically important thing. And the other one, which is, I do remember uh, being fascinated by, was how, where the power to charge the cars came from, because obviously that was an issue that would always be, uh, you know, a kind of a, a point of attack if someone wanted to have a go. Well, you know, it's all right. It's electric, but it's powered by coal. Yes. You know, all that stuff, which we hear all the time. But then the the one at the time I saw it, and that was at the Berlin race. A few yes. that was an early one. Yeah, uh, there was the big generators that were running on, you know, biodiesel or whatever at the time. Is that still the is that still the main source? So shifting switching over because in the first years we used something called aqua fuel that's it aqua fuel, yes. stuff. yeah they probably got you to drink it did they i can't remember yes that. i yeah. think i did taste it yes yes <laughs> they did yes um, i'd forgotten yeah. that yeah they gave me a little glass <laughs> with it in yeah to show that i i was the mug that did it and there was yeah. yes so in the beginning that we used that but um they're transitioning away from that in the, in the end the the target is to have either grid electricity so yeah. if we're in the right places during this season, I can't remember exactly which races are from grid energy, which ones are going to be from sort of the bio, the biofuels. Um, and there may, there may even be some races where there might be like a hydrogen possibility right. um, in the future. Uh, so the target is obviously to have everything. Grid would be easiest, but yeah. weirdly, even when we're racing, let's say in Paris, you can't find a big three phase out no. in a park. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> so, the scale you need. No, no yeah, you need, but you some need of a... the race tracks. We can yeah. go direct into the grid if if the racetracks have got the right um, right uh, connectivity. Yeah, and then you can obviously um, purchase um, green energy renewable um, from, the, yeah. from the grid. Because you know some of the places we've raced, I've, I've been um, uh, trying to get some of my statistics there as well. You know places like Uruguay, which are now 100% renewable. I think, yes, something like that. Yeah, or um, very close. Yeah, yeah, and I'm quite amazed at over the years that we've been doing this at how fast you know the uk has been growing yeah. quite dramatically hasn't it um, yeah. some big announcements now over those big wind farms off the yeah. north sea and stuff like that it's that's that's some of the stuff that i've enjoyed the most i think you know from when we sort of all started looking at this back in the 2000s let's say to see how many big goals have happened yes you, know, you watch these all the time don't you the, yeah England but I think the running. general public are, you know, gen well, why should they be? I mean, they're, they're, I don't blame them, but they're generally not aware. I mean, even that, I only learned that the other day from someone who works at the National Grid, was it in, because he was asking about how long I've been doing <laughs> fully charged. But in 2010, uh, the, it was about 40 to 50%, around, four, he said, average 40% of our electricity was from coal. Right. In 2010, I had no idea it was that high. Oh, that's wow. big. Yes. It's now less than one now. It's oh. just gone below one. The last in the last twelve months it's below one percent. So that's that incredible is incredible to watch change though, isn't it? That's what excites me the most. Yeah. Is that, you know, I think when you start doing something like this, everyone sort of says, Oh, this will happen and that's all the negative. Then it, when you just watch things accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. Yeah. And that's the that's the exciting thing to see from when we started to now how yeah. much change has actually happened. And yeah. There's still lots to go, but it's been really yeah. interesting watching that change over the years. So, good fun. So, yeah, I mean, that is, a, you know, it is a really, because can you see, if you, uh, I'm sure you discussed this, but can you see where the, the kind of, in a sense, the next generation of Formula E cars w w might be capable of or what, what you could do to, to take it to the next level? So the, the next cars are quite exciting, actually. That's the, they're, called, they're going to be the Generation 3 cars. Right. And so the, the basic parameters um, of those cars is they're going to go to, so we're currently at 250 kilowatts for drive. We're going to go to 350 kilowatts, which is actually getting you know near a 500 horsepower. So it's getting right. to be a, quite a quick car. But then also the front wheels will be able to regenerate energy. 250 kilowatts of regeneration from the front. From the front. Wow. Yeah. So they don't, they're not drive wheels, but they will have a generator attached. Yeah. So right. um, there's an incredible amount of, um, of that coming. So, yeah, that, that, that's going to be the, the regen and the, and the power is going up by a reasonable amount um, margin. But then we're also going to be looking at ultra fast charging. So, right. I mean, really, really high up in the, uh, up in so, the ranges of the sort of 600, 700 kilowatt range. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, in theory, then you could do a, a much longer race where you pull it, you do pull into the pits, change the tires and a massive fat wire goes into the top. Goes, <laughs> yes. So they're, they're figuring out at the moment what, what makes sense from a, 
the point of view of racing. How long should you stop? How much yeah. should you try to put in? And those kind of things. And hopefully that all matches what's happening in, in, in the real world, let's say. Yeah. Um, and we're jumping ahead by enough of a margin. Yes. That, you know, we're saying to try that. the future, let's say. Um, so, yeah, I think the next cars are going to be, well, super exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to the day that, I mean, part of the reason I started looking at this and, um, you know, having been in F1, the ultimate car to me would be four-wheel torque vectoring, you know, so yeah. four-wheel drive, four-wheel regen. I'm yeah. not sure if that's what uh, Mate has at Rimac. Uh, I'm not it's sure it's along what. those lines, yes, definitely, yeah. <laughs> So the, driving one of those cars would be, from a dynamics point of view, the most incredible thing, I think, uh, on, on Earth. Because you can't do that with a petrol car. No. You can't do some of the things you can do with a, an electric car. And yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that makes Formula E so um, competitive is that we're the, probably the, almost the only racing series in the world that has a peak power. So that keeps everything um, very, very um, level playing field. So right. in F1, for example, if you're given two liters of fuel, you might be able to get 700 horsepower, where someone else might only be able to get sort of 640, let's say. Right. And that means that there's a difference in your performance. Yeah. In Formula E, your peak um, power is currently 250 kilowatts. And so, therefore, it's not like someone's got, you know, 300 or, power. or, yeah. So then it's all about about energy saving. So during the race, you're only allowed to use up to a, a, the the amount of um, power. Right. But how you use that power over the race can make a big difference yeah. in the distance. So yeah, it means that it's more equal um, in in uh, in Formula E, and it makes it more competitive. We've had crazy amounts of winners in Formula E um, each season. There's yes. about six winners, six different winners. So, yeah. Um, yes, that is very different because it's basically, from what I've I've not been following Formula One, you know, closely, but it's basically Mercedes. You know, yes. who's going to win Mercedes? Uh, who won yeah. last time? Mercedes. Who's going to win the next one? Mercedes. You know, unless they have a catastrophic accident, they just win, exactly. which must be that they've got that incredible, oh, it's amazing that, thing for them. Yeah, that's where they've got that. They've given been given X amount of capacity and they've delivered more than anybody else yeah, so yeah it's what keeps formula e, you know quite exciting and there's another element to it we do the, the way we do qualifying so we go out in groups and right. the, the tracks we race at it means if you're in the winning the championship which we did last two years you go out first but that's right. a, that's to your detriment right you just can't go as fast if you're the first ones going out and basically cleaning the track yeah so there's all of these I don't think they, they're not really gimmicks in my mind. Um, they've, they've just naturally come out of the rules that the FIA's um, created that yeah. keep it very equal and even. And okay, if you're the one that's in group one and having trouble qualifying, well, that's just life. And uh, yeah. if you're winning the championship, that's your penalty. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting, I think, you know, things that we do in Formula E that make it exciting, actually. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. No, it is. I mean, I think my, I suppose my only criticism if i was going to get snippy about it from the point of view as a spectator is if you sit in the stands at, well i've done it once at brands hatch but at, at silverstone for instance you've got a huge wide open vista view of the circuit and mm -hmm. like when i was in berlin it was quite hard to find a place where you could see more than a few meters or a few or maybe 100 meters of track paris yeah. in a similar way i mean for completely understandable reasons because you've got safety fencing everywhere but you are a bit restricted in what you can actually see the race and, you, and it looks brilliant on the telly so I, I found myself i was at the actual race there's the cars going past that but i'm looking at the screen you know because <laughs> you that, come to monaco next time then why don't you come to monaco i do you know i've never been to monaco i would love to come <laughs> yeah it's when is that fun. when is that race is that is there one this year in yeah monaco? The, the, i think monaco is in about two or three months time so you'll be allowed to go i won't a yeah. mere mortal <laughs> <laughs> But that's the place you can see you can see yeah. an okay amount in monica in monica. yeah yeah um, yeah and a lot of the fans sit up on the hill you know and they can see yes down you can there. see more of it from there yeah. yeah so good place to come if you can next time maybe 2022 i'll have to yeah. save up i would love to come there yeah we've got because there's loads of other technology i think that's the other thing that is exciting mm. is this the sort of spin-off technology that's coming out of all that stuff so i mean there's a a solar powered kind of luxury yacht i think it, i think you can buy one for about 40 million you know <laughs> okay but it's pure it's 100 percent. sorry it has no fuels it has a small batteries 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, not enough to make it go very far, but it can go and it's been all over the Mediterranean and it is a kind of weird looking luxury yacht, but we could have, we could have a go in it for a day, you know, and you're just going, we've just got to get to Monaco to do that. That's the only drawback. Yes. <laughs> but that stuff is amazing. That, um, you know, I find that is the thing that surprised me the most. I think from when I looked at a G whiz and, and had a go in the mule version of the Nissan leaf in 20, 2009, 2010, around that time mm. that there would be one, that there would be a racing series, which yep. just was ridiculously unimaginable. Yeah. Uh, two, that there would be aircraft. We're going to see two planes in the next couple of weeks that are, one is battery, one is hydrogen fuel cell yeah. that are, that are flying. Like we'll see them. Like, I don't, I think I can. I am allowed to go in the big hydrogen fuel cell. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that's got the backing from um, Bill Gates and stuff, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so there's, yeah, they're extraordinary what they're doing. I mean, that's flown hundreds of miles, you know. But the other one is um, uh, probably not, by the time this goes out, it'll be fine because it's Rolls Royce are involved in it. So it's a company we've filmed with before, mm. but it's a Red Bull aerobatic plane. Oh wow! That's and then that pe- pe- very, it's in a way, it's very specifically. It's weird how these things work. That 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 Red Bull, Air, it's a Red Bull aerobatic plane that can take part in those contests. It flies faster for and um, for longer yep. than the petrol ones because the because uh-huh. I've been in one of the petrol ones. Bloody terrifying! They don't. They have a tiny fuel tank because a, uh, a Red Bull Air race is what it's about one minute forty seconds. It's incredibly short, <laughs> so they they can only fly for like eleven minutes, which is oh. slightly alarming. Well, the the electric one can fly for sort of twenty two, you know, so, <laughs> which is exactly the opposite of all the other sort of uh, you know. You'd have more range anxiety in a petrol one because it's yeah. qu- it's quite exciting to see where all of this technology is leading, isn't it? Even yeah. down to like micro mobility, you know, scooters yes. and. And then all the things that people are inventing, because now you can do little electric motors that can do all sorts of amazing yeah, things. Yeah. It just makes the whole the whole thing quite incredible to watch as, as all this technology. Yeah. Comes. Well, that, the other one that's just, you know, just coming, we're just starting to do stuff about that now, um, the Extreme E, which has definitely come out of Formula E. I mean, it's a kind yeah. of, uh, you know, those, that would be uh, uh, terrifying. Because I've been in, um, that was a long time ago in California, a sort of, a, a dune buggy an electric yeah. dune buggy really basic thing that would have been in about 2007 or 8 something like that but it, but the power of it what, that was the extraordinary thing that one had a range of like two sand dunes it wasn't you know, <laughs> uh, it was very but the actual what was I think that's the way that you know Formula E is a, such a good example of that is that the the motor the drive trains you could probably have built an impressive electric drivetrain 25 years ago, yeah. but you'd have to have a very long wire yeah. <laughs> to make it work. I think most people don't appreciate either, do they, that um, how exciting or fun it is to drive an electric car, yeah. especially you know, in sport mode or whatever, when you're driving around and you're yeah. using the regen and things like that, especially when you're just you know, around London or around the cities. It's quite a, quite a fun yeah. Fun thing. Plus, it's good for making phone calls because it's nice and quiet. So, uh, yes. Yeah. No, I did. I drove the, the Taycan, you know, a few hundred miles in a couple of days. And, and it was because I'm used to it. Te- I mean, I've got, I drive a Tesla. They are, you know, mine isn't a performance one, but they are by definition fairly swift vehicles. Yes. And, uh, but the, the difficulty with the Taycan was because I was do- the whole, my whole thing was I'm not driving it fast. That's not what I do. I'm an old bloke. I drive like a vicar. And it was all about getting maximum range out of it. Yeah. I was just, it was so difficult <laughs> <laughs> not to see a corner coming up. There's no one around. I could go around that a bit faster. Oh my well, God. And it was beautiful. That stuff i've been watching your videos learning about your uh, charging systems I'm, I'm sort of following along with my all right. trying to get um, <laughs> all, the, all the right charging and um, yeah. you actually talked to uh, i think it was graham cooper right? you were talking yeah. about isn't it from the national grid and, yeah he's amazing and graham, saying, yeah. when should i charge my car and he said um basically when it's cleanest and it's cheapest so he's got me yeah. looking at the um the drax stuff uh, a bit yes. sneaky, yeah. you know seeing when the right time of the day is to charge and, and those kind of things it's a fascinating lot of subjects yeah. because i mean that is such a it's, it's it's great that that has been acknowledged and dealt with you know i don't think uh, it, 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 it's a criticism of, of formula one but it was never it was never a topic of discussion is where does the fuel come from yes yes <laughs> if you think if you think back over the glorious history of formula one racing it was just you know it was just petrol and the fact that it's an integral part of and it's thought about, and it and it's a conscious thing with Formula E. I think is really, 
you know, I've been watching again some of your shows just to, just to learn a bit about, about where you've been going up to Orkney Islands and, and yeah. things like that. And it's quite curious when you look at the map, you know, you can look at that, um, the app that the, uh, that the National Grid does and you can see where the, the greenest yeah, the, electricity yeah. is and at which time of nights. And it's quite interesting to look at, you know, how much wind power we do actually have Huge in amount. the north yeah. of the UK. It's quite incredible yeah. how much that's changed. And, and I think, again, talking to um, Graham, he, he, you've probably um, said these things that he's saying, you know, we won't run out of electricity, even if everybody has electric cars, because yeah. we're just going to charge them smarter. That's, yeah. that's all. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people that are saying, you know, I suppose, scaremongering a little bit. But, um, you know, it is important, I suppose, that, that well, it is important, the total life of the of the vehicle. And another yeah. thing that Formula E's done, you know, in the recent past is, we're the only sport in the world that's been net carbon zero since inception. So they've been logging all of the, the carbon we've been using, right. the total footprint and doing um, projects to to offset that carbon where we couldn't reduce um, right. what we were doing already. I mean, does that include the entire sort of race season, like the transportation, the accommodation, all that stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, freight is, of course, one of the bigger elements yeah. of it as we travel around the world. So. We are doing a lot of work in in the next generations as to how we can reduce our freight. How can we transport it more ecologically friendly? Yeah. And then if we can't um, do that, we'll have to offset um, the carbon. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of work going on um, always you know, with Formula E trying to you know be uh, leaders in that in that in that yeah. uh, part of it as well. So it's that's that's what makes it exciting is because yeah. we're doing not just the racing. There's a lot of things around it. Um, that, yeah. You know, that we're doing. We're we're called Tachita, and uh, we're actually working with the Big Cat Sanctuary in, in Kent. Um, right. Which, um, looks after cheetahs and and, yeah. lions and other things, and we'd like to try and, you know, protect habitat in the, in the future with them. And each of our cars has got the name of a uh, cheetah at the sanctuary. Oh, really? Oh, brilliant. Yes. I didn't, I didn't realise there was that connection when I sort of got the name. Right. <laughs> so, oh, that is um, fantastic. Yeah, so we try to do other things as well, not just, just racing. And yeah. I must say... Um, Doing something good for the world as, re- as well as racing is 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 quite good as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it is fantastic because I mean that is the, the the one of the things I would had was thinking about earlier today when I knew I was going to talk to you was, and it's in in, in a sense it's not to do with the organisation of Formula E or that that but the the locations that you race at, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, it would make an enormous sense to have a fifty megawatt solar farm next to the next to the track that you use because yeah. you know it, it will benefit the community all year round but when you're there it can then be a real thing every single electron that's used in these cars is coming from that because they've got i've got a feeling that not having been there but they've got quite a lot of sunshine yeah well, it's, it's, and they do have big solar farms don't they to be fair to them yeah so and i think that's they're investing like everybody's investing quite heavily it's, what's really nice to be you know seeing in the world is that the pace seems to have been accelerated. Really accelerated, yeah. And and just people like GridServe doing what they're doing with the, yeah. with the solar farms next to um, stations on, yeah. the, on the motorway and things like that. I, I'm always excited by how fast things start to, when they really get going, the tipping yeah. point, you know, yeah. and, um, and it really starts kicking off. I suppose the, I think I was reading this morning that, is it right that the Porsche um, Taycan is, one of the highest selling Porsches in the UK. Yes, or yes. Like that. It's, there's uh, a hint, guys. There's a hint there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they cannot make enough of them. Well, I mean, they're also your home country. I mean, I'm married to an Australian, so I'm, I'm very close to a lot of these things. But uh, in fact, someone we, we we know of is one of the big funders is this the solar farm they're building in the Northern Territories, which is I think is going ahead now, is on a scale that no one can imagine. It will it will it will increase the global. Uh, installation of solar yeah. by a quarter, I think, in the whole oh, really? in one farm. It's massive. It's wow. multi multi gigawatt. I mean, it covers a vast area. Yeah. But I have driven through the Northern Territories, and you know, you could say that there's a lot. There, it's I'm most stunning. I mean, it is beautiful, yeah. but there's definitely enough space. Yes. <laughs> You're not damaging anyone. You're not going. Well, we could grow crops there. I don't think so, mate. <laughs> There's not much out there in that no. arid area. So, um, yeah, as long as you can get a supply line to, to where it needs to be. Yeah, well, they, they, it's to go to Singapore. I don't know if you know about it, but it's it's oh, actually, so it's funded by the fact that they can sell this power 
for, at a good rate because they're putting in a cable to Singapore. So it will it will be enough to power. It's you know it's one of those things where they say homes, which is the most annoying way of measuring things, <laughs> but it's some like like four point two million homes worth wow. of electricity <laughs> and battery storage, which they put all the way through and boosters, solar boost. There's all kinds of. Well, I think that's the other thing that, that maybe a lot of people don't realise that even here in the UK we we swap power, don't we, from France and yeah. Norway and and everybody. And this cable's running uh, backwards and forwards, and yeah. you can see that on those apps where they say, "Oh, we're getting X percent from France from today." From France, yeah. They've got overcapacity or, yes. or whatever. It's a, it's a really a proper smart grid, isn't it? Yeah, it's getting a lot smarter. I mean, one they're doing. They're, I think it's in now. They've put a big new cable in from Scotland down to somewhere like Blackpool or somewhere like to bring the wind power because there's so much wind power in Scotland. It is a it's a problem of of the bottleneck of transporting it. So they put in a new cable for the first time. You know, we haven't done that since the 1950s. You know, so it's a big, <laughs> and that's a very clear change. Is that the our power station is basically Scotland? Yes, <laughs> by an enormous amount of wind power from Scotland. You know, which is yeah, you know. it's incredible how much is um, how much is going on. Incredible. Yeah, but all those other things. That was a, okay. The first time I ever saw and experienced uh, induction charging was at. A Formula E event, which is for one of the support cars. It was actually a, a, um, a safety car. Yes. Yeah, safety car, an, an I three, yeah. I think it was. Yes. Uh, and the, and it was that was brilliant. You know, I drove it back to where it was meant to be parked, and you know, just move forward, so beep, 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 and it was charging at like fifty kilowatts straight away without any trouble. It was really impressive. Well, another project that I'm working on, I. Uh, I'm involved in another company called Street Drone, which we do autonomous cars. Ah, and sorry, that was what I wanted to ask you about. That was on my list. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> let me <laughs> let me ask you. Tell me about Street Drone. It's very, I was very unprofessional. <laughs> no, no, no worries. I was going because I was, I was thinking about the wireless charging because I think in the future that autonomous cars will need wireless charging. Yeah. It's, it's the most obvious because then they can just drive and yeah, park stop yeah. and, and, and get charged whenever yeah. they need to. So they'll they'll have complete control over when they need to be charged. They won't bother going on a journey unless they've got enough, enough electricity yeah. and, and they'll be smart and, and, and arrange themselves. So, yeah, we've got a company in, in Oxford. Um, my, my partner runs that, Mike Potts, and um, we sell vehicles around the world. So we've got a right. Renault Twizy, so electric. So... We started with the Renault Twizy, so I think wow. there's about 16 of them around the world doing R&D um, autonomously. Um, then we've got Can you sit, seriously, at the moment, is it possible to sit in a Renault Twizy and it drives you? Yes. Because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is the funniest car. I think the, the Citroen Ami, which I've recently driven, that made me laugh almost as much as the Twizy, but the Twizy maybe just... Need to, maybe you need to bring it down to your um, live um, show and... Oh, and, absolutely, uh, please, and yeah. You get you to, it to drive you around the track or something Wouldn't like that. Wouldn't that be brilliant? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're at, we're at Farnborough in September. Oh, That's where, we're, where we're doing it. But there's plenty of room. We're outside. It's all outside. We, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're currently hoping. doing a project actually up in Sunderland um, right. at Nissan's plant where we're taking a, what they call a yard tractor and we're making it autonomous and it's pulling a trailer between two areas um, of the... Uh, so, right, taking parts from one bit to another sort of thing. Yeah, right. so that's wow. the next project. And then we also do um, uh, a Nissan uh, ENV200. So right. we've got one of those. That, there's a number of those around the world, including places like Coventry University and um, right. SMLL in London, the, the test track down there. So those vehicles um, can be taxis, they can be delivery vehicles, they can be um, anything. Yeah. It's all in the R&D stage at the moment. Yeah. That's where most of it's up to. But we, we believe that it's all going to head towards the last mile delivery, which we're all, you know, all finding is being very common. Yeah. So probably maximum speed of 20 miles an hour. Well, that's what we believe is the all you need. Yeah. So little vehicles um, that drive around the, around the streets and, and do deliveries and returns and, and all sorts of little jobs for you. So right. Kind of like mobile infrastructure that's that's going around the the street. So that's our target to get a full level four vehicle on the at least on the test track and then on the roads in in the next two years or so. Right, because that makes so much more sense. I mean, I think the when I hear people talk about autonomous cars, you know, in the, in the same notion as that we own cars now. You know, mm. I would um, I don't know if I want to buy an autonomous car. And I'm so, I was I'm always chewing my fist at the back, going, I don't think you. Have I don't think that's the point. That's not the okay. idea. <laughs> we, do, we don't think that that'll be the case because, you know, just looking after them, making sure yeah. that they're, 
they're cleaned, their their sensors are all calibrated, yeah. uh, everything's working properly. We think that'll be more like operators will do that. Yeah. So it'll be maybe an Uber or someone yeah. like that will buy vehicles from maybe someone like us uh, to do certain jobs. And then yeah. maybe Deliveroo has a whole bunch of these vehicles that are operated by somebody different, maybe yeah. you know, Avis or somebody yeah. who actually ends up running the vehicles for, for the delivery companies. But, yeah. But I think I can see deliveries. It makes so much more sense because there's. I mean, I've seen some uh, kind of prototype Renault vehicles that were I, the idea of being eventually fully autonomous, and that is. The, and I, I used to think, well, how does he get the parcel? Well, that yeah. that one, it, the idea was that you would go out of your house. Yeah. It would stop outside your house, and a door opens. Yes. And that yeah. and that, so like a post postage box, you know, so you exactly. get your thing out of that, whatever it is. But, uh, yeah. you know, you could sort of say, oh, yeah, I could see that. I could imagine that working, you know, because yeah. there's I mean, I always love that any new technology. It is natural human. It seems to be a natural human reaction is you immediately look at a potential new technology and you come up with 87 different utter horrendous end of the world disasters that that will bring about. <laughs> and yes. I don't quite know what that psychology is. They must, someone must have done well, a study somebody, of it. But. Somebody said to me a while back, you know, if, um, you know, with Formula E when it started, let's say, um, if you asked 100 people whether it was a good idea and 50 said no and 50 said yes, then you should do it. But if 100%, 100 of people say it's a good idea, you probably shouldn't probably do it. Should. <laughs> it's very and, uh, good. <laughs> You need a balance not, somehow. You do. That is a very good point. I've not heard that one before. That is excellent. Yes, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, I just, there's just been a rush. I just tweeted something about uh, the Ford announcement. You know, Ford made this. Mm. Well, I, was, I went to their online conference the other day. That they're going to be 100% electric. And it, when, I think it is the make of cars. So there's lots of people who have always driven Fords. Yep. And they've never thought about having an electric Ford. They didn't know it was even possible. They're not interested. In it. And they suddenly go, what do you mean? What, Ford are going to live? What am I? I won't be able to charge it. I won't. It's going to run out. You know, instant, horrendous people who've never considered it before. And it's suddenly, <laughs> my Twitter getting, stream has been full of that recently. I think it's like you're getting used to mo charging your mobile mobile phone when you yeah. get down to London for a, a day or something like that. You just have to be planned and ready and yeah. you know, charge it when you can. And it, it just becomes a second nature. It becomes normal, it? yeah. Because I can't quite remember that transition from landlines to, you know, I don't remember going through that, but I certainly remember early friends who had them. So, rich, you know, rich friends who had mobile phones when they were called and they were a big block yeah. like that, were just <laughs> ridic and ridiculously expensive to use. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. You had, to, you had to be able to justify it. Maybe you're a yeah, very, very senior person and needed to be on contact all the time. Yeah. Maybe you 10 times more... Um, uh, capability to 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 travel or do things. Yeah. I, I imagine that were the people that took, did in the beginning. I, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's the thing with electric vehicles is that it, we're 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 at the sort of um, I don't know what what point of if you try and correlate it to mobile phone development because we haven't yet got the cheap mobile phone in terms yeah. of electric cars yeah. <laughs> that hasn't quite happened yet where you can, Oh, like well, I got this electric car the other day. I, I just bought it for the week. I, I'll yeah. chuck it after that because <laughs> it's so cheap. We haven't reached that point yet. <laughs> I think, I think they say, don't they, that a, that a market tips when you get to something like 18% penetration. So right. Norway's already passed, isn't it? Yeah. And UK is, I'm not sure where we're up to. In, in About our, we're getting, we're heading sort of towards five, which is staggering because we were under 1% for so long. It's certainly gone up hugely in the last 12 months. Yeah. And it's, and it's quite confidence building stuff, isn't it? It's like Formula E, when you see the cars racing, you say, well, it, they're capable of racing, then they must be fast. They yeah. must be okay. They must be able to charge them. They must be safe. They yeah. must not just burst into flames at the, when you yes. look at them and things like that. So um, I, one thing I do find about motor racing is that at least it gives it's kind of a confidence builder, you know, if they yeah. can do that, they must be able to do the, yes. the road job, you know. Um, well, it was also, I mean, even just the, from the point of view of crashing, because I think it was the very first race, wasn't it? There was yeah. a horrendous crash, yeah. <laughs> but nothing exploded and burst into flames. I mean, the guy yeah. got out and walked away, didn't he? That, that was an extraordinary crash. I mean, with incredible amount of safety procedures at the track and, you know, all these things, I think, when we started, people were like, well, what happens if this happens? And what happens yeah. if that happens? And like you were saying, the 87, the list yeah. of 87 things. <laughs> yeah. but, but now we've ticked them off and over six or seven seasons, it starts right. to become, well, don't get too blase. We have to still be careful yeah. because it is still yeah. a high voltage um, uh, device. But we've got a lot more confidence in, in all of the, yeah, using them. 
um, servicing them, all those yeah. kind of things, travelling. Is that, the I point. mean, there hasn't been a fatality as a result of Formula E, no. I mean, presumably there's got to have been some bruising. <laughs> if you ram into a wall at very high yeah. speed, that's going to hurt, <laughs> I would imagine. But. Yes, and, and I mean, when you, it's, when you see the guys doing the charging of the car, it's, it's a very big process, you know, you have to do yeah. such and such, then do this, then do that. Wearing right. a mask, all the all the proper things. It's a yeah. it's a it's a, a big job, but a careful job. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Mark, it's been amazing talking to you. I want I want you to come back, and I definitely want you to come to fully charged live with the, the autonomous Twizzy. <laughs> <laughs> Just be the most fun. <laughs> That is so exciting, and, and and good luck in Saudi Arabia. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I yep. will admit that I'm quite jealous that you're going somewhere. Well, you're going somewhere, actually. Exactly, going somewhere. Bo- Bognor Regis would be good. <laughs> I'm not fussed. <laughs> yes, so we'll, hopefully well, we'll have a few good races. It's going to be a night yeah. race, by the way, so oh. it'll be interesting. Uh, there'll be two races. And, um, oh, my yeah, God, a night race? I've never even thought of that. Oh, my God. Yes. Wow. So, but is, uh, is it floodlit? You don't have headlights on the cars. No, no. I didn't no. detect that though. But yes, it is a <laughs> yeah. big lights, just like in Singapore. Right. So, yes, um, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go there next week, obviously, and have a race. And we're the defending champions in both series, so we've uh, obviously got to go back and race against Mercedes and Porsche yeah. and everybody else. So uh, amazing! Yeah. Wow, amazing. Oh well, good luck with that. I mean, I can't be partial to to DS, but obviously, you know, yeah. I hope you <laughs> hope you thrash them. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right, it's been brilliant talking to you. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it was fascinating to talk to, to Mark. Uh, we're really hoping he's going to be bringing some of the autonomous delivery vehicles to fully charge live this year. Um, there'll be a lot of news about that already, or if not, it's coming soon. I'm not going to say any more now, but it's very exciting. We are pumped and stoked about fully charge live. Um, so Mark is going to be zooming all over the world this year, but hopefully we'll be able to get that. And hopefully if it would be fantastic if we can get him to come along as well. We'll, we'll definitely try. Anyway, that's all. I'm not going to do any of the subscribey things. Please do, obviously. Uh, you know, we're, the, the podcast is doing really well. I'm really thrilled. How many, It's really growing, the audiences, and we're going to keep it going. Um, so that's it. Uh, as always, if you have been... <laughs>